and welcome to this event that's celebrating the RSS Statistics in Sport Sections Prediction Competition 2023, which in itself is celebrating the Women's World Cup in 2023. So the idea of the session today is that we'll introduce the competition, so outline all the things that you need to know. And then we've got some fantastic speakers here today to share their, their wisdom with us. So we've got Smart Odds, who actually sponsor the competition, and they're going to give us a, a really interesting presentation. And then we'll follow that up with a panel discussion where we've got some previous winners to, again, give us their insight and, and hopefully share their winning ways with us. So first of all, we'll introduce the competition just so that you can understand, sort of the, give you the context for our expert speakers. In the past, then, so this is becoming uh, an annual event. The RSS Statistics in Sports section runs a prediction competition for a sporting event. So the first one was predicting the outcomes of matches in Euro 2020, which of course actually happened in 2021. And then we followed that up with predicting the outcomes of matches in Wimbledon 2022. So the idea is always the same. So you know, the goal of the competition is to make probabilistic predictions of the outcome of every game in a certain tournament. So this year it's the Women's World Cup. Um, the idea is you make your submission before kickoff of the first game, before the first match happens. So what you have to do is predict all the games that you know are going to happen and then all the ones that could possibly happen as well. So this particular competition will make predictions for all the group games and then every possible knockout game that could then follow on from that. You're free to use any data that you like, provided that it's publicly available. So you can scrape from public websites. The idea is it's just about this being a level playing field. So for example, our fantastic sponsors, Smart Odds, might have access to data that, that I don't have access to. So it's just about making it fair. Therefore, then when you submit your entry, we want uh, obviously your predictions, but we also want your code and your data just so we can double check everything's as it should be. Um, you can enter as an individual or as a team, totally up to you, whatever works best for you. And you can update your predictions at any point before the start of the competition. So before that kickoff of that first match. Uh, but if you submit a new entry, only the most recent submission will be scored. And there are three prizes available. Um, there's a prize for the overall winner. So that's the entry with the best log score. I'm not going to go through how the log score works today, um, but more on that a little bit later. Um, so that's the first prize, the overall winner. But there's also a methodology prize. This is chosen by the judging panel, and it's for people who've taken an interesting approach uh, to their predictions. Again, that's why we want to see your methods and your code in your submission. And then a new prize this year, we've got a student prize. Again, this is awarded by the judging panel. It's based on a combination of the log score, so whatever students uh, are scoring well on the leaderboard, and also taking into account methodology used as well. And as we said before, because you can submit as an individual or as a team, the rule is that at least one person in the, um, uh, the team has got e-student membership of the RSS, and that's I believe absolutely free. So if you're a student, you can get e-student membership of the RSS and you can enter the competition and hopefully win the student prize. And um, of course, if you're an individual, that's nice and straightforward. But yeah, if you're a team and one person is in a student in that team, that's fine. You'd still qualify for that prize. And the big prize that's available is that you are invited then to present your work, what, what you did at the 2023 RSS conference, so it's in Harrogate this year, and reasonable expenses will be paid courtesy of Smart Odds, the sponsors of the competition. So that's all I'm going to say on that on this today, because as I say, we want to listen to our expert speakers. But all this information that I've given you today and more is available on our GitHub site. I'll pop the link in the chat in a minute, um, so you can see those rules that we've just discussed. You can see how the scoring works. So like I say, it takes your probabilities, your predictions, and it, it scores you based on those. Again, details about those prizes, how to make a submission, a really uh, useful 
item there that I'm certainly gonna gonna use this year is there's a getting started section where they've added an um iPython notebook that describes fitting a model to a publicly available data set and producing some predictions in the correct format. So again, great place to get started and then make it your own and get entering. A section on getting in touch, so how you can get in touch with us if you've got any questions. And then right at the bottom, there's some suggested resources, which include some publicly available data sets and some information about the previous competitions, including a recording of the equivalent version of this event from 2022, where one of our uh, panelists spoke uh, in more detail about the method that they used when they won the Euro uh, 2020 prediction competition. So again, um, perhaps some valuable insight there. So that's it from me. If you've got any questions about the competition, uh, you can bob them in the chat now, but as I said, I'm gonna save them up and we'll do questions right at the end because actually your question might get answered as we go through by some of the people who are gonna speak today. So bob those in the chat and we'll get to those later. Um, but without further ado, I'm gonna let uh, our sponsors, Smart Odds, um, give us their presentation. Thank you very much, Jessica. Hi, everyone. Uh, I have some slides, but I'm going to try not to use them until I need to use them. So okay, this, okay. this is this is my new thing at the moment. Um, so let's see how that goes. Uh, so hello to everyone attending. Hello to everyone watching the recording. My name is Milt Mavrakakis. I've also got my colleague uh, Ian Gorley here, where we are both from Smart Odds, the sponsors of this competition. And I promised Jessica I would talk to you a little bit about, uh, I talked to you a little bit about smart odds and also talk to you uh, a little bit about uh, about modeling football, about any kind of general tips or tricks. This looks like a very serious crowd. So hopefully you won't find the thing I'm going to present today to be beneath you in any way, but let's see how it goes. Okay. so. Um, Smart Odds, uh, if you haven't heard of us, uh, on the website it says we specialize in providing in-depth research and analysis on numerous sporting events all over the globe and producing world-class bespoke software platforms. So what does this mean in practice? Well, it means that we predict outcomes of professional sports on behalf of our clients. Now, our clients mainly have to do with the betting interests of our owner, Matthew Benham who, as I'm sure some of you know, is also the owner of a couple of football teams, Brentford in the Premier League, and also Micheland in the Danish Superliga. So some of the research we do finds its way to, to the football teams. Uh, now, Smartos has been going for uh, nearly 20 years. I think we're founded in 2004, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, our initial focus, and it's fair to say still, Probably our primary focus is football as the sport with, with the biggest betting market worldwide. Um, but we've also carried out extensive research on any sport with a big betting market. So all of the big North American sports, American football, basketball, baseball, ice hockey, uh, and also other global sports. So tennis, cricket, golf, and uh, many more. And we're also still looking for, we're still starting out on a, on a few other more niche sports. Um, so as you can imagine, with all of these different uh, ongoing projects, we are always recruiting. So we're always very, very excited to hear from people with a passion in predictive sports and let predictive sports modeling and uh, with experience in that sort of thing. So uh, I'm going to share my slide, the slides that I'm not showing you now, I'm going to share them afterwards. And there's a link there to some vacancies on our website. I'm assuming that if you're attending this talk or watching the video, you are probably more of a quant analyst type. So sorry for stereotyping you, but um, there are also other vacancies if you go onto the website. Now, um, it's fair to say that Smart Odds uh, are one of the industry leaders uh, in this particular field. Uh, me personally, I work on basketball research. So I've been with the company for uh, coming up to 13 years. So I head the basketball research and uh, I'm also the head of quant training. So this is a more recent thing, uh, might be interest to some of you watching. So uh, our graduate training program, which, uh, which we've had as of last year is mainly 
for uh, for young quants, usually people who have just graduated uh, with a master's in statistics or related discipline, and who are really, really keen to get into sports modeling, but don't necessarily have the, the real world experience or the work experience. And um, we've got a six month program where we help them come up to speed and become full blown sports quants. Well, that's the that's that's the dream. Okay, now um, I'm also joined by my colleague Ian Gole, as I mentioned. Uh, Ian is the head of uh, Quant Football Research, so he's clearly the person who should be giving this particular talk. I'm not the basketball guy, but you know, because I, I, I somehow seem to have drawn this particular straw, so I'm going to keep going. Uh, it's the one where you kick the ball, I think. I, I looked that up before I started. We're going to be fine. <laughs> All right, so um, here's what I want to talk to you about today. Now, this started out as a conversation I had maybe last year, I think, with Ian um, about a paper by Boshnikov et al., which some of you may have read, uh, the bivariate Weibull count model for forecasting football scores. I'm going to put a link to that. Now, this is a really, really good paper, by the way. This is I, I really enjoyed reading it. It's from 2016, I think, but it only came on my radar um, last year. So we were we were looking at this paper with Ian, and well, the most interesting thing they do in that paper, the main topic, uh, has to do with the distribution for goal counts that they assume. So the authors make the very good point that, well, the Poisson is an obvious choice, but the problem is that there are a few natural alternatives to a Poisson distribution for low count data such as this. I mean, the negative binomial is an obvious alternative, but I think that we would struggle to name too many sort of off-the-shelf models, right? So the authors say, well, this is quite restrictive that we're sort of stuck with using this model. And how can we build how can we build a more elaborate model that might be able to capture some features of the score distribution? Um, so what they do, which is pretty clever, is well, they, they assume that the goals scored are the output of some counting process, okay, so a renewal process, if I guess, to be more precise. And uh, as I'm sure many of you know, if we assume that the inter-arrival times, so the time that elapses between goals, if we assume that these inter-arrival times are IID exponentials, uh, if they're exponentially distributed, then you recover a Poisson process, right? If the time between goals is IID exponential, then at the end of the match, the number of goals scored by each team will be Poisson distributed, or indeed any um, in the first half or in the second half or any subset of the match, you get a Poisson, right? So what the authors do is to build a more, to build a richer count distribution, they focus on the inter-arrival times. And rather than an exponential model for those, uh, they say, well, what if these were Weibull distributed? And the, the Weibull is an interesting choice, first of all, because um, the exponential is a special case of the Weibull. So it includes the Poisson model. The Poisson model is, is nested within this one, but also because, and this is what makes uh, the Weibull distribution such a common model in survival analysis, is the fact that you have a parameter that controls whether you whether the hazard rate is increasing or decreasing over time. And how you set this parameter leads to very different count distributions, right? So they do this, which is pretty nice. And what's even nicer is um, there's a reference to an older paper, which I also was not aware of at all, where apparently, even though there isn't a closed form in the strict sense for the count distribution that you get for the total number of occurrences, in our case, for the goals scored by the end of the match, if you assume Weibull into arrival times, you can express it as an infinite sum. So by truncating that sum, they come up with a really good approximation that can be efficiently computed. So they fit that model to the data and they make some predictions um, for Premier League football, which look really good. And again, I'm going to post a link to this. It's a really good paper and I absolutely recommend that you read it. Um, but what I wanted to focus on is something, I guess, much more basic and hopefully uh, more fundamental, which is how the authors of this paper address the question of whether goals are Poisson or not. Because the starting point for, uh, rather the, the, the motivation for introducing this more elaborate model is the fact that the Poisson model just doesn't capture some aspect of, uh, of goal counts, right? So this is what they do. 
the authors fit a Poisson distribution to home and away goals. Okay, they've got five years worth of data from 2010 to 2015 from the English Premier League. So they fit a Poisson to home and away goals separately because we expect them to have different means. Then they compare the observed and the expected goals and they perform a goodness of fit test. Now, this is, again, it, it, if, it, if it sounds like I'm singling them out, this is, the, this is the most common approach in the literature. So even if you go back to the, the, the very well-known paper by uh, Dixon and Coles, and Stuart Coles is, is one of our colleagues at Smarters, I feel I should say, um, in the Dixon Coles paper, um, they, they do something similar. So they don't, they, they don't show the entire calculation of the entire results, but they do make it clear that, that they perform some sort of, uh, some sort of test on these uh, aggregated results, on these empirical results. Okay, uh, I'm going to share my screen now. I think I've uh, gone as far as I could without. So let me share this. Can you all see this? Yep, our goals pass on. Okay, so how do we test it? Um, okay, so I'm not using the exact results, all the plots from the uh, from the paper, but I've uh, I've downloaded the Premier League data and I have tried to to recreate the results. Uh, and here's what I got. Okay, shall I make it a bit bigger? Can you all, can you all see that? Is it visible? Okay, all good. Okay, so we've got home goals on the left, away goals on the right. The uh, kind of turquoise bars are the observed counts, or rather the observed uh, relative frequencies. And then the red bars are the corresponding Poisson probabilities. Um, I've truncated these at, I've truncated these at six goals, so the final category is uh, six plus. Now you can see that the Poisson is not it's not a terrible visually it's not a terrible fit, right? Um, but you can also see that it doesn't degrade certain spots. So for away goals, you can see, for example, that um, teams score that the away team score zero goals a bit. Uh, a bit more than we would expect, a bit more frequently than we would expect, and score one goal a bit less frequently. Visually, it doesn't seem as a terrible fit, but of course, because we have quite a lot of data here, there's five seasons worth, uh, when we perform a chi-square test, okay, so here I've got seven categories, so uh, six degrees of freedom, we estimate one parameter for each of these, so five degrees of freedom, and you can see that you comfortably reject the null hypothesis that these goals are Poisson distributed for both the home goals and the away goals. Okay, so slightly better fit for home goals, but still we comfortably reject the null hypothesis. Now this is what the authors do. And again, this is what most people seem to do to answer this question. But what I want to ask you is, is this a sensible thing to do? Is this a sensible way to test whether this is an appropriate distribution? Okay, I see some people shaking their heads. Okay, I really, you clearly thought about this before, or I gave it away. Um, yeah, so it, it, it's not a sensible way to do it, right? Because if we think about this hypothesis test, this this goodness of fit test, well, what is our null hypothesis here? Our null hypothesis is that uh, if I introduce a bit of notation, so yi are the goals in the ith match, so the h for home and a for away, well, we're assuming that home goals across all matches are drawn from a Poisson with a common parameter lambda. And similarly, uh, the away goals across all matches, N, capital N as the number of matches in the data set, are drawn from a Poisson with common parameter mu. Now, this is not a sensible test because this is not a sensible assumption, right? So if, if Man City were playing at home, um, if Man City were playing at home versus Southampton, Right, then the distribution of Y home and Y away would be very different to the same two teams facing each other, but with Man City playing away. You wouldn't, you wouldn't for a moment assume that these are drawn from the same mean because teams matter, right? Team effects matter. So what could we do instead? What is what model is, shall we say, a step up from this one? Okay, well, at the very least, we would want to assume that home and away goals are IID Poisson, but where the parameter lambda depends on the match. Okay, so where we have a lambda I and a mu I. 
for the ith match. Now, in practice, we would want lambda i and mu i to depend on some covariates, x i. So you could set something up where this depends on the past performance of these particular teams, or if, if you're trying to, if this also contains things like home advantage, and I'm going to elaborate a bit on this model in a moment, then you also want to draw information from all past matches and so on. There may be some parameters there, theta, which you want to estimate. Okay, you can do this in a, in a Bayesian setting where you assume that your parameters theta are also drawn from some prior, so on and so forth. Okay, and note that this is still an independent Poisson model. Okay, so I'm assuming that the home goals and the away goals in the same match are independent of each other, which is, as if you've ever modeled football, you probably know that's not a great assumption. Okay, but this is still one step up from the previous model. Now, what I want to show you, if it's not immediately obvious, is that the output that you would get from such a model, so where the home goals and the away goals are exactly Poisson, right? But where what you observe at the end is not a single Poisson for home and a single Poisson for away, but rather a mixture of Poissons with these different parameters lambda i and these different parameters mu i, that the output from this can easily look like over dispersion, which is usually what causes us to move away from an assumption that things are Poisson distributed. Okay, so uh, here's some simulated data. And here I'm going to thank Ian because I nicked his code for this particular bit. Thank you, Ian. Um, so let's assume a simple model. Okay, so if you've read the Dixon Coles paper, this is very, very similar to that. I'm going to assume that um, on the log scale, uh, the 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 parameters lambda i and mu i depend on the attack rating and the defense rating of the two teams playing in this match. There's a global mean parameter gamma, um, and there's also home advantage. Okay, so this is this is a fairly standard model. Log of lambda i is the attack parameter of the home team plus the defense parameter of the away team plus the global mean plus home advantage. And for the away team, it's it's well, the mirror image of that, but with minus the home advantage. Okay. So what I've done here, or rather what Ian has done here, and I'm stealing his work, um, is to generate some data, just, just generate some fake data from this model, making some very simple assumptions. So all we're going to do here is sample the attack and the defense parameters from a Gaussian. Now, the way I've set up this model, um, I should probably say negatively correlated because large values, large positive values of alpha are good and large negative values of beta are good. Okay. So negative beta is strong defense, positive alpha is strong attack. And typically better teams have better players. So they tend to be, so these tend to be negatively correlated. If you're good in one dimension, you're typically good in the other dimension on average. So we've just sampled some team ratings um, from a Gaussian, assuming some correlation between these two. Uh, I'm assuming that these are static. So for the five year, I'm going to generate five years worth of data. I'm assuming that team ratings are constant over time. And then I'm going to come up with some sensible values for eta and gamma. What the sensible values mean? Well, it means that I pick some values. I've generated five seasons worth of data uh, that look like Premier League data. So the correct number of teams, the correct number of matches, and so on, using this independent Poisson assumption. Okay, so I've got my summary statistics here. Uh, so mean home goals, and standard deviation of home goals, and similarly for away goals. So I played around with uh, eta and gamma and the, the variance on the prior of alpha and beta and the correlation to get it to close enough. You can see that it's pretty close, right? So if I showed you these five years worth of data, you probably wouldn't be able to tell the difference between those and the real data. Okay. So what does it look like when I repeat the test? So when I produce the same plot again, as, as we did for the five years of real Premier League data, when I do it with the simulated data? Well, the answer is, it's very similar, right? It's very, very similar. You can see that the plots are nearly identical. I mean, here it looks like we get a slightly better fit for the away goals than for the home goals. But again, we comfortably reject a null hypothesis that home and away goals are Poisson distributed if we assume that these Poisson distributions uh, have the same lambda and the same mu for every match. Okay. Uh, now, again, this 
might not be a surprise to any of you, but this is something that this is something that you see a lot in the literature. So this idea that if you have particular distributional assumptions that you want to test, uh, the people will often do that before fitting a model. And what I hope this illustrates is that that's not really a great way to go about it. Okay, so I guess the moral of this story is that we don't want to rely too much on aggregated data, on empirical data, if what we're trying to do is to test particular distributional assumptions, whether a particular distribution is a good fit for the data, whether an assumption of independence uh, is sensible given the data. Um, if we're going to produce plots and statistical tests, we need to make sure that these are relevant to our modeling assumptions. So it doesn't make sense to assume a common lambda for all home goals, right? If you're then going to assume different lambda in your actual model. So I guess the answer to the question, what should you do instead, is to is to try to answer this question by formulating a model. Okay. So formulate a model where you come up with uh, where you come up with a simple structure like the one I showed, and then compare the predictions of this model to the actual results. And then you can see if particular score lines are overrepresented or underrepresented. So this is true for the Poisson assumption, but it's also true for the independence assumption. We would want to test it this way. And of course, if you have a particular model structure in mind, it's always a good idea to simulate some fake data from that. So you can compare it to the real data and see if you're sort of in the right ballpark. If, you're, if your model for the, the, the data generating mechanism can really capture at least some of the nuance of what you see in the real data. Um, that was kind of my point. So uh, I've got a I've got a couple more things to show you. Uh, now Jessica asked me to talk a little bit about modeling women's football, uh, which I know even less about than modeling men's football, uh, which is uh, which is a very low bar. Um, but uh, I did take a look. Uh, I did uh, do a bit of internet research to see if there are any good pointers. And well, it looks like the conventional wisdom on the topic is that in women's football, the results that are overrepresented, and when I say overrepresented, I mean, uh, compared to what we would expect from a simple model, like an independent Poisson model, are different to the score lines that are overrepresented for men's football. Okay, so in men's football, again, if you've read the Dixon Coles paper, I'm sure you're aware of this. Um, low score lines are overrepresented. Okay, so one nil, nil one, nil nil, one one. These are all overrepresent. These are all un these are all overrepresented in the data. They occur more often than we would expect from a simple uh, in by very from a simple independent Poisson model. So the authors of that paper come up with a modification, and it's a pretty clever one in that the marginal distributions of home and away goals are still Poisson, um, but it, managed to it manages to capture some of that nuance for the low score lines. Now, one thing that I saw in a number of different places online is that in women's football, it's not those scores that are overrepresented relative to an independent Poisson, but rather extreme score lines. So 3-0, 4-0, 5-0, and above. So the question is, well, is this true? Uh, now, I asked uh, Ian for some data. OK, so these come from uh, apparently from our fit set for international football. OK, so I've labeled these home and away goals, but I guess they're not exactly because a lot of these are matches played in neutral venues. OK, so should probably call them team one goals and team two goals. Um, but I just looked at some relative frequencies. And uh, here's what I got. So the top one, women, these are percentages, okay? The top one is women, the bottom one is men. Um, you can see that there are some differences. You can see that there are some differences here. So 1-0 is still the most common result, but it's not. It's only about 8.6% of the time compared to 11.7% of the time uh, for, for men's football, okay, for men's international football. And you can also see that you actually get quite a few wins of 6-0, uh, and above in women's football, certainly way more than you get in men's football. So if you take the difference of these two tables, okay, so this is women minus men, and the negative ones are the ones that you observe more frequently in men's football, and the positive ones are the ones you observe more frequently in women's football. And you can see that from this, it definitely appears that these extreme score lines, because the difference in frequencies is positive, that you see these a lot more in women's international football than you do in men's football. 
So my question to you is, what can we conclude from this? People are shocked that I asked them questions. Okay, what can we conclude from this? Any ideas? Can we really conclude anything? From oh, sorry, Ben, I interrupted you just as you were about to say it. Oh no! Do you mean about the plausibility of the Poisson model? Yes, or about the or about whether there is a difference between men and women's football. So we need to make different modeling assumptions. Uh, it looks to me that the the home team and the away team goals are sort of negatively correlated. So okay. a big uh, away team goal for oops, sorry, for a small home team count. Yeah, which is, I think messes up the independence between the two Poisson. That, that's counts. a good point, actually. That's a really good point. Um, but what about specifically about these extreme score lines? Does it mean that we need some sort of modification if we're modeling women's football that makes these results more common? Do we need to boost, let's say, the probability of 4 nil, 5 nil, 6 nil? Not, ne not necessarily. Okay. Not necessarily would be my answer too right because we can easily we can easily come up with a model structure we can easily come up with some sort of assumption that leads to these aggregated results to these empirical results without needing to drop the assumption of independence now again i've never modeled women's football i've never really modeled men's football either to be fair but I would guess that relaxing the independence assumption is probably a good thing to do because in any sport I have actually tried to model and anything, any area where I have some experience, um, it's sensible to assume that the goals or the points, or whatever of the two teams are not independent, but we can't conclude that on the basis of this, right? So for example, if it is the case, let's say if I were to simulate some data to try to recreate these sort of frequencies for men's football and women's football, well, I could get these extreme score lines simply by drawing the, the ratings of the women's teams from a prior with, with higher variance, right? So if it is the case that in women's football, there is more, there's a greater difference in ability between the very worst and the very best teams, than there is in men's football, or if it is the case that in women's football, let's say most of the teams sort of cluster around, most of the teams are around average and you have a handful of teams that are well above average, okay, you would, you would also see this kind of behavior. So you don't need to relax the assumption of independence to obtain something like this. So I would say that what we can conclude from this is, well, okay, we have an obvious feature in the data which is these extreme score lines occurring quite frequently. But until we've really fit a model, until we see if we can obtain these sort of patterns in the data from a model where we, uh, until I completely messed up the sentence and it was my punchline. Let me try that again. Until we've seen whether we can recreate these patterns without assuming complicated dependent structure without boosting certain results, we wouldn't necessarily want to jump in and assume it. We would start with something simple and then try to look for any lack of fit. But this would be lack of fit based on the actual model predictions where we're modeling the strengths of the different teams, where we are trying to capture this thing, which again, it's, it's pure speculation on my behalf, the idea that there might be bigger gulf in skill between the best and the worst women's teams. So that is what I've got from you, the, the moral of the story for women's football. I, I did find a really, really good paper uh, on uh, applying the Dixon Coles model to women's football. And I was going to say a few things about that, but I realized that the, that the authors of that paper are going to speak <laughs> as part of this. This is the paper by, uh, by Michels uh, et, et al. Um, so I'm not going to say too much about this so I don't embarrass myself in front of the authors when they watch it. Uh, so that's everything for me. Um, as I said before, uh, we would love to hear from you. Um, if you are the sort of person who takes part in this sort of competition in your spare time, uh, then you're probably the sort of person that we want to hear from. Okay, so I'm going to share these slides later and feel free to, to email me or Ian, who you're going to hear from in a moment. Um, if you are interested in a chat or if you're considering uh, applying for a job with us.
So thank you very much. Thanks, everyone. I'm going to mute myself now. I don't know if people have questions. What's the plan, uh, Jessica? Are we taking questions about this or are we going straight to the panel? Um, brilliant. Well, yes, I was about to say thank you for that. That was absolutely fantastic. And yes, as you were speaking about it, I was going to say great plug for our um, webinar next week. So tune in next week um, or if you're watching this at a later date watch the next video where we're going to exactly sort of investigate those sorts of questions. Can you tweak dicks and calls or do you need to go and do something different? So brilliant plug. Thank you very much. Um, I think what we'll do is we'll go um, straight into the panel discussion because I think that gives people um, a chance if they've got questions to type them in the chat rather than kind of fill in time. However, um, I've, I've got one question for you um, that I, I, I want to, I've always wanted to ask, so I'm going to take my opportunity. Um, so I always wonder, like you say, there's people in academia writing papers about these things. Then you've got gambling companies doing their thing. And then you've got companies like yours that are sort of trying to beat those gambling companies. And I always wonder who's, how do those things compare to what the academics are doing in the literature? And it's so interesting that you're saying Dixon and Coles, one of the very famous names in the business, works for Smart Odd, is in, in Smart Odd. So would know better than anybody sort of where that comparison lies so i'm going to take my opportunity to ask you at this point can you can you tell us kind of where that would be do you think what you're doing is way more advanced or i i think ian could certainly answer that question <laughs> um I, I i would say that that um, much of what we do has as you'd imagine many common features with the academic literature, we're not doing something um, wildly different, but we do have access to a large amount of data. And certainly there are, certain, there, there are um, approaches we take to modeling that we wouldn't share, let's put it that way. Um, uh, I guess we might like say whether it's much more advanced than what's in the academic literature. There's some excellent work in the, in the, in the, um, from the academic community. Um, but there are certain things that we have, certain uh, certain ways of using the data that we have access to, um, that you 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 won't have seen necessarily in the academic literature, and that that we would be willing to share. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I would just add one thing to that, which is that also, it, it it's a question. I mean, it, it it's a question of 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 quant hours as well, right? I mean, we've got you know at Smart Odds at the yeah. moment, we've got around. 20 quantitative analysts working full time uh, on models on all of these sports so you know that that's i mean in terms of resources we're uh, we're in a really good place and these again we've got nearly 20 years of research which is proprietary to fall back on if we start working on a new sport or on a new market we can look at approaches that were taken in other sports and were successful or even in some cases approaches that failed in one sport but work really well for a different sport for a different market you know so you, you get that sort of cumulative effect of, of building on existing research which uh, obviously is not in the in the public domain yeah, really. And I suppose you've already answered one of my questions because I wondered if you were keeping an eye on the academic literature, but you've absolutely said that in your talk that you are keeping an eye on those things. So, so yeah, it sort of sounds like maybe you're kind of doing the same sorts of things, but maybe you've got resource to do them kind of, yeah, at another level. And um, right, excellent. Thank you. So selfishly, I got my question in, but if anyone else has got any questions, put them in the chat and we'll put them um, to our panel um, in a moment. So let me introduce them. At this point, our panel of uh, previous winners that we've also got with us today. Um, so I'll, I'll let you introduce yourself. So should we start with um, Matt? So would you just introduce yourself so people know who you are? Yeah, hello. Um, so I'm Matt. I'm uh, from the Euro 2021 competition. Um, I also entered the Wimbledon competition, but honestly, that was a train wreck. So they wouldn't have invited me back just based off that. Um, I'm a second year PhD student in statistics um, at Oxford University um, and also work for Oxford United and Oxford City football clubs, um, advising them on data analysis. Fantastic. I think maybe we might need to ask about Wimbledon in a moment um, and why that was uh, more of a train wreck. Uh, ben, will you introduce yourself, please? Hi there, just thanks. Yeah, well, I took part in both competitions. In, uh did okay with the Wimbledon one, pretty terribly with the Euro 2020 one. 
Uh, I blame Macedonia for that. There was very little information on Macedonia, and I sort of lost a huge number of points, uh, competition points. Thanks, Ben. So we've got some nice balance on the panel, which is which is great. Thank you very much. Um, so, yeah, first question then. What inspired you to enter the competition? Um, so I think Milt was sort of getting at this as well. What's the sort of person who's entering these competitions? We'll keep the same order. So, Matt, what's inspired you to enter the competitions? Yeah, so it was actually, it was during, uh, I remember the Euros one, it was during lockdown. Um, and it was like when you were only allowed six people in a house. Um, and we were going to visit my wife's family and there were seven of us and I was the unlucky one who uh, was just uh, ostracized so I was like looking for things to do and just like found this competition and thought I'd write a model in that in that spare time um, but yeah I do I don't know competitions are great I think it's a good it gives you a kind of good incentive to actually do some work um, and then like you can see how it does um, so I'm always a big fan of entering these kind of things so you said that you work with a couple of football clubs was that were you already doing that or is that since since you did that predictions in your when you were ostracized <laughs> yeah so i think i'd started working with oxford city already by then um so that was also very much a kind of lockdown boredom thing um and then i've since i've only been working with united for a few months um so okay cool thank you ben uh, I think it's a really important thing for the st academic statistics community, really. The, um, I, th I think some of the machine learning and AI type people, when they have these competitions based around a common data set, you know, like those, those MNIST famous data set where people are all, all trying to, whole community gathers around a data set and challenges these, challenges each other, takes other people's, um, you know, people pull up their code for free and people try to break it. Um, this sort of collective community, uh effort <clears throat> i think is the key maybe to driving progress and i don't think that's been happening enough in the statistics community recently or ever actually thank you and can i bring the smart odds people in on that one because that's something i noticed on your website you, you say about how you develop models and then you can sort of test them on the market straight away and it's kind of got that accelerated timeline again as opposed to academia so um, is that something like picking up on what Ben's point, uh, Ben's point there? Is that something that you agree with? That kind of idea of competition being good? Um, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I mean, I'm still there after 13 years, so absolutely. Um, but it, it's fair to say that it, it's it's what drew me to the to the company to Smart Odds because, like several of my colleagues, um, I started out sort of you know I'd finished a PhD. In statistics, I was applying for academic jobs. I was, I, I, I very much had sort of one foot in the academic camp and trying to decide what I what I was going to do. Um, when when I heard about when I heard about this job, I I mean I wasn't even aware that this was uh, that this was a viable career. It still it still shocks me sometimes that that, that it very much is. Uh, but I was always interested in in sports modeling. I was always interested in in basketball analytics. It sort of my in, uh, studying for my masters and then my PhD in statistics coincided with a period where uh, basketball analytics community really really grew. And it was at the point where before everyone got hired by teams, so everyone was very keen to share information online. So I first got into that, but then. When I started working for SmartOds, I realized exactly what you mentioned. So just this idea that um, I can come up with an idea or read something in a paper and think, oh, you know, that could work, spend sort of a week kind of playing around with data, trying to come up with uh, trying to come up with a model, trying to implement something, finding something, spending the next few weeks trying to develop it, maybe presenting it to the rest of the team. And then if if it works, then sort of within a month, um, our clients are betting off of that model and very, very quickly find out how good or bad an idea it was. But I think it's a I think it's a very good I think it's a it's a very good filter, as it were. Like you very, very quickly find out what works in practice and what doesn't. You certainly find out quicker than in other applications of statistics, I think it's fair to say. And that's and for me, that's very much part of the appeal. Thanks, 
Excellent. Thank you. Um, right, next question then for our panellists. So like I say, we've got people who were successful at the two different competitions. And I should say, I think what's great about this competition, it's kind of fusing ideas from both of the past competitions. So we had football to start off with. Then we had tennis where you were predicting men's and women's uh, results at Wimbledon. So now here we are back on football, but thinking about women's football. And again, Milt's already mentioned this. So thinking about will we have to tweak anything because it's women? Um, and there could be lots of reasons why, because it's women's football, you might need to tweak it. So let's start actually with, well, what would you be tweaking in the first place? So Matt, can you give us a really brief, because say people can go away and watch a fantastic presentation for the detail, but can you give us a brief insight into what your approach was for that um, Euro 2020 competition? Yeah, so for the Euros, it was kind of um, just kind of looking at the past results from the last few years um, and trying to build the sadly much maligned after that last talk uh, Poisson model um, to predict kind of to give everyone an attacking and defensive strength and predict results based off that. Um, and I think, you know, in some ways that works exactly the same for the women's Euros, like you could just load in the equivalent data set and it would run. Um, one of the things that I found when predicting the men's was that kind of if you've got very, very weak teams, they can really skew your predictions of the strengths. Um, so for the men's Euros, I removed San Marino from the data set. I think looking at the women's Euros, sorry, Women's World Cup, there may well be kind of a bigger set of teams which fall under that category. And so you might need to be more careful about what data you use. Yeah, no, well, I wouldn't say that that previous presentation maligned the pass on process, actually, at all. Yeah, but yeah, so that's interesting. So you're using a similar type of thing to what we've seen there. And um, I think there's something interesting as well about we're getting people to predict international competitions where, like Milt was saying, home and away, you do maybe have that, you have a lot of data on qualifying matches that were home and away. Um, and then the actual tournament that you're predicting is is supposedly neutral. So there's difficulties there anyway. And then with women, um, yes, I think there certainly is this idea that there's going to be weaker teams because that's how, what happens in qualifiers for the men's game, isn't it? That you have some amateur sides, but they don't normally get to the actual competition, whereas in the women's game, they will get to the, the competition. So I think there will be challenges there. Um, thank you. Ben, OK, can you give us a little insight into what your methods were for the past two competitions? Uh, sort of, I, I think similar to Matt's, but but uh, I was I wanted to use the the match results and, and fuse those with the um, bookmakers odds. Partly because I don't I don't think the the match odds were informative enough for me. Like um, a, a, a team say winning one nil on a day doesn't really tell you much about the team, but if you see that the bookmaker uh, so you know the implied probability of like ninety percent uh, chance of them winning. That tells you a lot about the the strength of that team more than the one nil result. Um, conditioning on the bookmaker being right, and I think more often than not the bookmaker are oh they're very good. So, so, so combining the result with the bookmaker's opinion, I think is the key. Interesting. And yeah, if you watch that presentation, so again, go to the GitHub site for this competition, you'll see at the bottom, there's a link to that YouTube recording. So the other person who spoke that day about their method was really focusing on the bookmakers odds. So I think you're kind of combining those two ideas about thinking about the match results themselves, and then thinking about using information from bookmakers odds as well. Um, yeah, really interesting. Thank you. Um, we've sort of touched on this um, already. So I, again, I don't know if you want to to give the game away too much because I'm hoping that you'll enter again this year. But thinking back to, to what you've done for those competitions, I suppose if you were asking you to predict another men's competition, would there be any improvements that you would make to your previous iterations? But then like I say, we've also got this idea that it's a women's competition as well. So is there any tweaks that you'd make for the women's competition? As I say, I'll answer in as much detail or as little detail as you want because i know i obviously don't want to give away your your winning uh winning ways so again matt any anything that you'd change maybe this time either just because you were, you've got improvement ideas or because it's women yeah i guess one of the things you have to deal with and i noticed this when kind of doing a prediction model for the men's world cup last year um is that european football is quite well connected like particularly in the men's game with the nations league there's lots of like at least relatively serious games 
between teams of similar levels. And so you can get quite a good grasp on who's better than who. Um, but if you've got kind of, you know, a set of teams in South America, and maybe you know how good they relatively are, and a set of teams in Asia, you may not have much link between them. So I think kind of being careful about, I don't know, not being overly confident about your predictions might be helpful. Um, and COVID would also have played an impact, like there are just kind of fewer games in the four year cycle than there would have been otherwise. Um, yeah, so really interesting, this idea that if we'd have asked you to predict a men's World Cup competition, there would have been differences that you'd have to make. So this is, again, that's another thing that's different that we've thought about. You're absolutely right as well, the COVID impact. And I think in the Euro 2020, 2021, it was a strange tournament that was always going to be strange because it was hosted in lots of different places, which is, is not the same. And then adding COVID restrictions and things like that going on, I think that was a really standalone tournament that will be quite different to others moving forward and um, so brill yes thank you very much ben any anything you're going to reveal about how you might improve things moving forward uh not really so so i think the i, I have a similar problem in a sense of um sparsity of data um so so i was thinking like sparsity of connections or, or comparisons um also I, I keep bumping into overfitting problems when there's not enough data and uh well i'm interested well uh, either now or later to hear how matt and milt and ian get round overfitting if they've got any sensible ways any good priors or sensible constraints to put on their parameter fits um should we bring smart odds in have you got any any wisdom you can help ben with there That's you. Yeah. you well, in some regards, it's a tricky one to answer from our perspective because it's certainly true that there's a lot less um, data available for in internationals in general and in women's international in particular. But we do have, a, I suppose, we we do have access to somewhat richer data set, which um, reduces the, the the impact of of, of those sorts of problems. Um, but certainly they still exist for us as well. And you actually touched on what I thought was a very important point earlier, where you mentioned the use of um, market data, where that's available, um, and, and any other sources of, um, or any, any other uh, observations, which, which provide some signal about the strength of the teams, other than the goals scored themselves is useful. Um, so there can be additional signal in, in other accounts. I'm not actually sure how, how much uh, how much of that you can get access to in the public domain. Um, I mean, the main problem I've had with with modeling uh, national teams in international competitions, which I don't know if it's I don't know if it's as big a problem in football as it is in in basketball. But it's the fact that it's essentially when two teams play each other, because you've got you, your data set is obviously not just going to include like the big competitions where you assume the different countries are at full strength. It's also going to include other matches throughout the year. It's essentially being able to label accurately when teams were at full strength so you can learn a lot by these matches and when it's sort of not necessarily a friendly because it counts for something but it's not the world cup or the euro and in i mean in basketball where i have some experience this was this was a serious issue even before and then at some point fiba which is the equivalent of fifa uh, decided to move all of the qualifiers to for, for major tournaments to smack in the middle of all the national leagues so now you know when you see that france is playing for example in the middle of the nba season and also the middle of the french league season you know that none of their top you know it says france on the jerseys but maybe none of the top 10 players are playing so you it's it's not really france in any sensible way um i don't I don't know if this is as much of an issue for, for football internationals, but I can imagine that it's something that may come up. That's really interesting. I, I see a similar thing in the football where a really good team might not score very well against a less good team because this is not trying very hard because they don't maybe they don't have to. If they've got enough points already. And then so it makes it look like they're not doing very well, but it's just because they can't really be bothered to field their full strength team. Yeah, I agree. I mean, trying to distinguish when that's happening would be useful. Ian? 
Uh, yeah, yeah. I also wasn't sure when when Ben mentioned overfitting. Uh, yeah, I suppose that term is used in and uh, in, in referring to more than, than one type of thing. One being um, it, it adding too per, too many parameters to a model, for example. But the other being um, uh, more in the, in, in the machine learning community, they tend to refer to, um, to essentially tuning the model to protect it with bits uh, as being a form of overfitting. And I think in it, it's it's worth um, bearing that in mind if people are uh, iterating through a number of models uh, and perhaps setting up some kind of back test to assess the predictive utility of sample for the model that they should be cautious about um, the dangers of, of building a model that won't generalize a uh, sample very well. And that's a bigger problem in women's international football because you just don't have much data uh, available. Um, which also points to something that I guess might give some people some some people who are thinking of entering the competition, but maybe haven't got a lot of experience, that perhaps they should give it a go because um, the law, the winner by log score uh, will will be influenced to some degree by chance because there aren't very many fixtures. So uh, it's worth a it's worth a shot for anyone that wants to give it a shot, really. Yep, absolutely. And sort of following on from that. Um, I was going to say, how long did you spend um, on the competition, uh, our two previous winners? Is it is it something we can do in a day or two? Or were you spending every day and every night for three years getting ready for the Wimbledon 2022 prediction competition? Matt? Yeah, I didn't spend too long on either of them. I think maybe probably roughly a day or a day and a half in total for the Euros. And then the Wimbledon one was just a... Just afternoon of being stupid with my brother uh and that is why it didn't go quite so well um but yeah i don't think you know i think in to a certain extent with quite a limited data set like has been touched on already almost a very complicated model will just overfit and so going with something simple um may well be the answer interesting thank you very much ben how long did you spend thinking about it uh probably more than five but under 10 hours possibly close to 10 some evenings have disappeared but it was really fun because we've got got um some hours might have slipped away excellent thank you so we've not got long before the competition starts but i think in some ways this levels the playing field a little bit that everybody's got a limited time to just try and get something in and see and see who could, who'll win uh, brilliant so i just asked one more question because we're already over time but i could talk to you a lot all day about this stuff um so any we've sort of touched on this already but any sort of last thoughts any top tips to people um so for my previous winners insights into winning ways maybe because both of you have sort of had one year that was good and one year that was not so good so anything you could tell us that could help as win and again similarly we'll come to smart as if they've got anything that they've, they've sort of told us that already so matt anything that you can pass on to us other people who've not won yet to help us try and win this year yeah i think i think it would just be kind of what i said before like don't go don't go too over complicated um and in particular also just like check your results i remember the first time i ran my code which i almost submitted like scotland were the favorites for the euro 2021 and while we'd all love that I'm not sure that's necessarily uh, necessarily accurate. So, yeah, go simple and make sure it's not stupid. Yeah, that's a good point. Sense checking stuff as well is really good. Oh, good advice all the time as well. Uh, ben, any top tips? Uh, same as Matt, I guess. But well, 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 yeah, in in the past, I've sort of scanned through, yeah, just, just my eyes looking for very high and very low probabilities that you forecast because you, you're pretty uh, vulnerable to these in the competition. But this year, I think, as Milt was saying, there will be some very high and very low probabilities for match outcomes. So, uh, so maybe that advice is no longer relevant. No, that's a really good point. So again, I didn't go into it today, but if you look at the way that you scored, um, you're giving things a number between zero and one. And if you give it to zero or one and you are incorrect, you're out, you get infinity, right? So you're right, it can be really, when you're up near those either end of the spectrum, zero or one, it can really, really hit you. Like you say, you can have a game that really hits you because you put probability on. But it's true, um, we did a prediction competition for the women's Euros last year. And there are some where it's just, I think it was England against Northern Ireland. They were 
they weren't professional and they were playing against an England team. So it really should be up their high, but it is that, oh, am I going to put the house on this? Um, am I that confident? Yeah, excellent point. Smart odds, can you give us any any top tips? Um, I, I'm trying to think of something profound to say, but it, I've just realised that, that that I've stolen it from from uh, what's it from Anand uh, Rajaraman, which is I'm I'm a firm believer that more data usually beats more sophisticated model. Um, I think that you know, and I think that we've already mentioned uh, we've already mentioned um, market information. Like if you can find if you can scrape some. If you can scrape some some data from bookmakers, that's very, very, very helpful. There's going to be information in there that there's going to be signal in there that you can't extract from just the match data, no matter how hard you try. Uh, and obviously, there may be other data sets that are out there in the wild that you can find. And working out how to incorporate those, I think, is 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 generally a sensible. It's I would say, in my experience, usually a more worthwhile thing to do than to fit more and more elaborate models to kind of the same small data set i hope that was suitably helpful and vague no that is good and it fits with what we've been saying today about you know where smart odds and the betting companies and academia where they all fit in together it, it, it's it's sort of on on that message as well okay thank you very much all i'm just going to so i see that the slides um we've got the links to the slides in the chat i'm just adding the link to the github where you can read all about the log score and all about the detail of the competition um, from this year. As I say, do check out that link to the recording right at the bottom of the page because you can see in a bit more detail Matt's method uh, for predicting the men's Euros a few years ago. So with that, I'd just like to thank our fantastic speakers. This has been absolutely brilliant, as I knew it would be. So I just thank you one more time. Uh, give you some Zoom applause. And thank also thank everyone for coming here today and everybody for watching at a later date. And I think all that's left to say is good luck with the competition. Good luck. We look forward to and seeing thank you. Thank you very much for having us.